Red Cloud Financial Services is your preeminent source for mining industry opportunities. The team provides a unique tailored marketing program dedicated to reaching the right people from its mining-focused global network, giving clients access to industry-leading events and conferences, retail and institutional marketing, plus an in-house growth-driven digital agency. Red Cloud Financial Services has access to some of the mining industry's most notable companies and CEOs. Hello and welcome to this RC Live event. I'm Mark Bunting. Today we're talking about lithium, but more specifically DLE, direct lithium extraction. We have Kobe Kirshner, uh, Kirshner rather, joining us from uh, Red Cloud Securities. We'll get to him in just a moment. Uh, as a reminder, if you have any comments or questions, you can put them in the uh, comments section. Uh, let's get a little background on lithium and DLE first before we uh, bring in uh, Kobe Kushner. Now, with a 700% rally since the 2020, lithium prices have uh, continued to hold steady despite what has been a tumultuous market. Direct lithium extraction, or DLE, has been de-risked over the years, just in time for continued and increasing demand for the commodity as the EV revolution and batteries become a primary market. Now, this technology isolates lithium from solution without traditional evaporation methods, ultimately making for better project economics. Kobe Kushner is a research analyst at Red Cloud Securities. He's joining us today to talk about his uh, recent lithium market update, which is entitled Direct Lithium Extraction, What Mining Investors Should Know. Now, this includes education on DLE and specifically things mining investors need to know prior to investing into lithium resource developers that plan to use DLE. Great to see you, uh, Kobe. Thanks for being with us. Yeah, thanks for having me, Mark. I'm, I'm excited about this report. I'm excited to, uh, to give you my take. Yeah, for sure. And I, I was saying uh, to Kobe off air that uh, it's an exhaustive report, very interesting. I learned a lot about the DLE, and he also has some ideas about the types of companies that maybe you want to be uh, looking at. So first off, Kobe, uh, why this report now? What was, was there demand for it? Or uh, well, what's the purpose of it? Yeah, I mean, look, uh, as you mentioned, prices are up over 700% since 2020. So um, and, and it's really driven by uh, demand, particularly from the EV sector, uh, but supplies are very, very tight in the lithium space. Um, so DLE is a disruptive technology. It's something that we believe uh, can help fulfill the current uh, and magnifying supply deficit. Uh, but yeah, why now is really because we've been having a lot of questions from investors um, about the technology and we've learned that there's a lot of uh not misinformation but but i guess misconceptions rather uh, about what dle is and what it isn't so this report is really to, to help serve as a guide uh a dle 101 if you will and it's really to help clear the air on some of these misconceptions now uh let's uh, just uh get a, a basic backdrop off the top as to how lithium is traditionally produced. Sure. So I guess there's, there's really two main sources of lithium. So the first is hard rock. Um, hard rock, they, they typically occur in pegmatites. It's what mining investors are more familiar with. Um, the mineral of interest in these pegmatites is, is something called spodumene. Uh, and when you're dealing with that, the grade is measured in terms of lithium oxide. So roughly half the world's uh, lithium comes from hard rock sources in Australia. Uh, and the other half comes from South America, but in the form of brines. So that's uh, li lithium in rich salt waters. It's typically pumped out from underground and then you store it on surface in these shallow uh, man-made ponds. And they call those evaporation ponds. So the sun evaporates out the water and you're left with a lithium concentrate. Right, which you'll explain to us uh, is a, can be a, a very timely uh, and expensive process. And DLE uh, eliminates a lot of that potentially. So uh, you'll get to that. Um, so investors are, are used to reading reports about hard rock resources. So mm -hmm. how does one go about calculating uh, li liquid resources when we're dealing with lithium? Yeah, I mean, liquid resources are, uh, it's a totally different ball game, right? So 
Um, you know, if you're if you're looking at hard rock, it's pretty straightforward. You know, you take your volume, you apply your density, and there's your tonnage. You multiply it by your grade, and there's your contained metal. With liquid resources, you have to take the volume of the reservoir, but you can't just apply your your volumetric grade because there's a lot of solid volume uh, within the reservoir that you first need to remove. So you need to multiply it by the porosity, and that's really uh, the percentage of the void space that you need to remove. Uh, and then, or sorry, the, the void space that's within the rock. And then further, like not all the pores within the rock uh, necessarily contain brine. So you need to apply a, a brine and pore factor uh, to account for this. And you'll also notice that uh, with hard rock resources, they, they tend to use a cutoff grade, you know, the, the minimum grade that would make the deposit economic. And you'll notice with lots of these DLE resources, they've started using a not cutoff grade, but a cutoff porosity instead, because anything uh, below a certain porosity just won't flow. You'll have a very difficult time getting it out of the reservoir. Now, let's get to uh, DLE, direct lithium extraction. And you're going to uh, use a coffee filter analogy for us. It's a nice uh, sort of easy <laughs> picture to understand. Yeah, I mean, look, it, it, at a high level, it's, it's the recovery of lithium from brines without the necessary need for evaporation ponds. Uh, there's several different types. And a simple way I like to think about it is by imagining making coffee. So you run your coffee through a filter, the filter catches the coffee grinds uh, while the water seeps through. So imagine that the coffee grinds are the lithium ions. You then wash it off the filter and you're left with your lithium, your, your high purity lithium. Um, it's, it doesn't actually work like this. You know, it's a lot more nuanced than that. It's for one, it's, it's actually a chemical process. It's not really a physical separation process. Um, but I guess the point is, is that it's a lot easier to think of, uh, DLE as a process where you run your brines through uh, a filter, if you will. And that filter, uh, selectively removes lithium from the solution, specifically lithium. And you say in your report that uh, not one size fits all, especially geographically, be it Alberta or uh, somewhere in the U.S. or wherever it might be. What, why is that? Yeah, uh, well, I'll, I'll say even within the same jurisdiction, uh, DLE still doesn't, it's still not a one size fits all solution. And the reason is because each brine chemistry varies by each project. So you're right, you know, what works for a Solar in Argentina might not work for a Petrobrine in Alberta. Um, impurity levels, uh, things like hydrocarbons, for example, can mess with the performance of certain DLE technologies. Uh, so because each brown chemistry varies, each DLE solution needs to vary as well. Okay, so um, I, I gather uh, from your report that DLE is not entirely new. It has been used in hybrid form with traditional methods by Livent, for example, in, in Argentina, going back to the 90s mm -hmm. and China since 2017 or so. Again, according to uh, your research, has been um, has been uh, experimenting with with DLE as well. So, uh, so does it work DLE, or is it still sort of at the experimentation phase? Uh, that's a, a good question, and the answer is never a simple yes or no. Uh, the question I think one should be asking is the extent to which a particular DLE solution works for a particular brine. So there's been plenty of success at the pilot levels. Um, you know, we, we've seen recoveries of over 90% uh, in a matter of less than an hour. Uh, but what surprises some, and, and you alluded to it, is that there actually has been some success at the commercial scale as well. Um, so Livent, for example, they've been using it since the 90s in Argentina. And then since 2017, at least three DLE brine operations have been uh, successfully commercialized in China. Um, and it also depends on how you define, you know, what works. So, so typical recoveries of evaporation brines can be 40%, give or take. I mentioned 90% for, for DLE. So if, if DLEs can at least meet this 40%, you know, I, personally, I would consider that to be a, a potential winner, right? Right. And, and I understand from your report, it, it makes it look like DLE is faster, it's cheaper, it has an ESG component. So it, it seems like a winner, but why not just stick with, with traditional methods? Why DLE? There's a few reasons, and I think you, you hit some, you hit the nail on the head with some of them. So first off, recoveries could be high. 
Um, you know, I mentioned that some some DLE companies have demonstrated ability to recover ninety uh, percent plus. Um, and then you also, it, as long as your coffee filter, let's say, has very high selectivity for just lithium, you'll also have very low impurity levels. And then uh, further to that is that the process can work in minutes to hours as opposed to months. So like you might be waiting with evaporation, you might be waiting over a year in order to get uh, your your high enough grade uh, brine concentrate. And even then your recoveries might still only be around 40%. So that that plays into your economics for sure. Um, the other thing is that evaporation not, not all brines are amenable to evaporation. So with evaporation, you need to start off with higher grade brine because uh, otherwise you're just waiting way too long uh, for the sun to do its work. And further, you need high evaporation rates. So to do that, you need to be located in a hot, arid desert. That means evaporation just won't work with some of the brines that we see, uh, especially out in Western Canada, because again, that's not a, high, a, a hot, arid desert. And you also mentioned the whole ESG standpoint. So Evaporation brines consume a lot of water. The land footprint is massive. DLE doesn't have these massive footprints and it might not even need a tailings dam because uh, you can you can take the lithium void brine and potentially just re-inject it back into the aquifer. Um, and I can't I can't stress the the land use requirements enough, right? So uh, we're, we're talking about less than five percent of the land footprint compared to a traditional lithium operation uh, that produces a similar amount of lithium. Um, now, mining investors are, are used to hearing about grade and high grade is better. And yet it's, it's not the case necessarily uh, with lithium. Grade is not king. So explain that aspect. Yeah, that's a, that's a concept that... Uh, mining investors definitely need to wrap their head around because they're so used to that phrase, grade is king. Uh, mining favors grade because uh, generally it provides better margins, all else equal, right? Your, your higher grade means you're mining less ore but getting more metal for it. Uh, with DLE, uh, grade, grade is still a factor, but we think investors should focus more on deliverability. Um, you know, that is the flow rates that you can get from each well. So in the report, I break this down. I, I illustrate two hypothetical projects, Project A and Project B. These are both DLE projects, but B has double the grade and only a sixth of the flow rate per well is Project A. So let's, generally these companies are targeting about 20,000 tons a year um, of uh, lithium chemical production. So Project B will need to drill three times the number of production wells as Project A because their, their flow rates are really bad. And in, at least in Western Canada, it costs about three million bucks a well, give or take. And this can easily blow out Project B's CapEx and it, that alone could kill the project despite it being double the grade. And it also hurts from an OPEX standpoint because of course uh, now you have to permit and operate three times the number of wells. So I think the bottom line here is that grade is only part of the equation and grade alone does not necessarily translate to better margins as we've seen with uh, we've seen with some of the projects that we've looked at. All right. So investors need to understand and look out for grade and de deliverability when it comes to uh, DLE companies. What are mm -hmm. some of the other factors that, that are key that investors need to know about? Yeah, you're right. There's a lot that goes into it. And and I'll also say deliverability is more than just flow rates. And you have to look at the factors that go into deliverability. Uh, so things that feed the, the flow rate equation, that's uh, the three Ps, which, you'll, which you might hear about in the oil and gas sector. So that's pressure, uh, permeability, and porosity. Other considerations, that's the, the thickness of the reservoir, but also the depth of the reservoir. So of course, uh, if you have a shallower reservoir, it means you don't have to drill as deep. And it also means uh, th there's less pumping requirements. So that definitely bodes well from a cost standpoint. Uh, this is why we actually favor management teams that have significant oil and gas experience. Because the, the oil and gas experience, uh, the oil and gas operators anyways, they understand these factors that will translate to good deliverability. Um, an another consideration is the brine chemistry and how that plays with the actual DLE process. Uh, so we mentioned in the report that things like hydrocarbons uh, can actually coat the sorbent beads or the, the coffee filter in my analogy. 
and that could prevent the coffee filter from doing its job and that will ultimately affect recoveries. Kobe, uh, go back to the oil and oil and gas aspect. Uh, I find that really interesting. I know one of the companies you follow and you'll be talking about these down the road, uh, some of these uh, DLE companies uh, worth looking at, but uh, can you flesh out the, the importance of an oil and gas management team with experience and how that translates to uh, uh, running a DLE company? Yeah, I mean, so the oil and gas, they know their subsurface hydrogeology very well. They are used to dealing with liquid resources. Uh, mining people generally, and I, I say this as a mining person myself, um, we're used to hard rock. We're not used to liquid resources. And we're also used to chasing grade. So it's, it's just something to pay attention to. Companies that are acquiring ground, and it might not necessarily have uh, the highest grade, but if it's run by proven management teams that have that that know their oil and gas, you know maybe you could bet that they're actually acquiring this based on the total uh, cost equation of getting a ton of lithium carbonate out of the ground, for example, or producing lithium carbonate. I'll say right now. Uh, what are the risks to uh, DLE? projects uh, slash companies, how is testing done and, and, and what do we need to look for? And especially as it, as it relates to trying to scale. Yeah, that's a, that's a very good question. So I guess when, when you're starting off, uh, uh, when you start off evaluating the technology uh, as a company, uh, it usually starts off in a lab-based environment, you know, test tubes and beakers, and then maybe a, a lab-based pilot prototype and then companies look to do an actual pilot and perhaps a uh, move to a field demonstration plant um i will say there, there's always risks with scaling up any technology you know what works in a petri dish might not work out in the field um i think some of these risks with scale up can be uh at least somewhat mitigated if if you can set up these uh demo plants in a modular approach rather than just making one big bigger uh, plant to have several smaller plants that you know work. And if you could set those up in parallel or, or perhaps even have several standalone projects, um, that can help mitigate those risks. Uh, lab test results are still important. Um, you know, we generally look for recoveries above 90%. Uh, but we also want to see, it's, it's more than just recoveries, right? Because we, we also want to see durability of the DLE material um, or the, the, the coffee filter. Right. So we want to see at least 500 cycles of testing with minimal deterioration of the of the of the coffee filter. Um, and of course, testing needs to actually best mimic the real world operating conditions. So we prefer to see technologies um, that are being tested using actual lithium brines as opposed to synthetic brines. Uh, Kobe, you, you've said that uh, direct lithium extraction could disrupt the entire lithium supply chain. Uh, you're pointing to a lot of things and, uh, you know, the, the footprint, the low carbon emission, uh, less water, uh, less energy, et cetera. A lot of very positive things. So how could it disrupt and, and what are the prospects for doing that? I, I think it can really disrupt the supply chain. But to, to really explain this is to, I think we first have to look at the bottlenecks uh, when it comes to current lithium production, right? So with any hard rock mining operation, whether it's uh, a lithium mine or gold, uh, generally production rate is limited by the geometry of the ore body, right? Some ore bodies just aren't meant to produce high tonnage. Uh, this can make scaling up production to meet future supply a challenge because it's just very hard to scale up. And then evaporation brines, it's different, but it's similar in terms of the, the challenges of scaling it up because uh, you're limited by your evaporation rates as well as the available real estate for these large evaporation ponds. So again, that makes scale up a challenge. DLE doesn't have these bottlenecks. So scaling up a DLE operation can potentially simply be a function of drilling more wells. Um, now we know that Market sentiment is not great globally for a lot of reasons, although we did say off the top that lithium prices 
actually have been holding in uh, pretty well. And, and could we argue that uh, lithium is still in a bull market and that uh, uh, we can look for winners now? It, it's early days uh, in, in the DLA sector, but uh, what's the best way for investors to, to try to isolate the, the kinds of companies that who, who may be um, uh, first out of the gate, so to speak? Yeah, so I guess, you know, if, if, we're, if, if we're trying to evaluate who's going to come out the winner of this cycle, uh, in my view, it's going to be the first movers, right? So taking another step back, um, we mining world, we've all heard the phrase, uh, you know, the cure to high prices is, is high prices and the cure to low prices are, are low prices. And I think that does apply for lithium in the longer term, but definitely not in the short term, because it's not like there's any uh, idle supply just waiting to be taken off the market. Uh, Benchmark put out a report not that long ago uh, stating that we need over 70 average sized lithium mines just to meet 2035 demand. Um, as the mining world knows, uh, new mines take a long time to come online. So the winners, at least in, in our view, is that it's going to be the first movers, right? Companies that can rapidly de-risk their projects and commercialize them and lock in supply contracts while prices are still at record highs. Anything else you want to add, uh, Kobe, that you haven't touched on? I guess one thing um, I, I do want to circle back to the previous uh, question on, on why it's so disruptive. And I, I spoke about scale up, right? So one of the companies that we're looking at, they're talking scale up of 20,000 tons a year to 150,000 tons a year. And that's with DLE, of course. And that's of lithium hydroxide. But on a LCE basis, that on a lithium carbonate equivalent basis, that represents about a fifth of current total demand. And this company is not alone. There's a lot of companies that are delineating resources fast uh, throughout even just in, in Western uh, Canada, by our count in the last few years, we've seen 50 million tons of LCE uh, be delineated just in the province of Alberta. So imagine if these companies can now flick a switch and, and, and bring this new supply to the market. That's why I think it's so disruptive because you can scale this up and you can really uh, have some of the, the biggest potential uh, lithium producers uh, in the world at least in the making. Kobe, we have a question here from Andrew. Uh, he says, have there been enough projects to understand the difference between the resource reserve and actual performance reconciliation in hard rock terms? In hard rock terms? I'm not, I'm not sure I totally understand the question, but uh, I guess circling back, touching on, on, uh, on projects that are currently uh, out there, um, at least in DLE, one of the risks that I should touch on more is that uh, companies like to keep their proprietary DLE technology close to their chest. Um, you know, we, we can suspect what type of technology it is that they're using, um, but it's we don't actually it, it, we don't actually know. So while Livent has been doing it successfully in Argentina in a, in a hybrid approach. Um, you know, we don't actually know uh, what, what their proprietary material is. Okay, well, thanks for that uh, question from Andrew. I thought he may follow up there to maybe clarify what he was asking, but uh, we will uh, we'll wrap it up there, Kobe. Fascinating stuff. Uh, and thanks for joining us. I'm sure we'll talk to you uh, soon. Yeah, thanks for having me. It's been a pleasure. All right. All uh, right. Thanks again uh, to Kobe. Now, just a quick note here. Uh, thanks for joining us. You can also uh, always rather uh, check out redcloudfs.com for more live events, webinars, and exclusive content. Uh, remember to go to redcloudsecurities.com for full disclosures. Uh, I'm your host, Mark Bunting. Thanks a lot for joining us today, and we'll see you next time.